mark in there in Isaiah chapter 24, if you would. And just remember, I mean, if you think about what you just heard as we read Isaiah chapter 24, um, I'd just like to point out how many times um, the word earth and the inhabitants of the earth was used um, in Isaiah chapter 24. That's what we're going to look at um, this morning. So this morning, we're back in our Confounding the Wise series. We're looking at, um, overall, we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 27. Go ahead and turn there. This is kind of the basis of this series that we've been doing, and it's kind of a series we're bouncing in and out of, and we're talking about um, popular personalities, popular um, experts um, of today, and we're looking at how um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 27 applies to these people. Look at verse um, 27 of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if you would. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. So this is talking about how the wise people of the world, people that, that worldly people would look at and say, that person is wise. If they don't have the Lord, um, they will just be confounded. And we've looked at some pretty confounded people. We've looked at um, astrologers. We looked at Mickey Okaku. We looked at um, people like Jordan Peterson, um, people like um, Joe Rogan, these experts of today. But because of, of their blasphemy and because of their turning from God, they've just completely confounded. And the things that they talk about and that they believe in are completely um, ridiculous. So this morning, I want to talk about... Um, another um, popular person in the world today, another wise person in the world today. But I do want to say that this sermon this morning is going to have a different tone to it. And the reason is, is because um, I do not dislike this person that we're talking about this morning. Who I'm talking about this morning is the man that I'm sure you've all heard. He's in the news all the time. His name is Elon Musk. Elon Musk. I do not dislike Elon Musk. Okay, Elon Musk is not saved, and I'm going to show you this morning that just that one thing confounds someone. But Elon Musk, why, why do I not dislike him? First of all, he's not prideful. He's not someone that strikes me as vain. I'm going to use um, many quotes from Elon Musk this morning. Most of the quotes that I'm going to use are from an hour and a half long interview that Elon Musk gave with the Babylon Bee. It was the cleanest thing I could find out there um, where he's kind of talking about all kinds of different things. If you don't follow the Babylon Bee, it might be, I'm not saying that, you know, I endorse what the Babylon Bee believes or talks about, but it might just be the cleanest source of news out there today. I decided just a few weeks ago that Fox News is complete um, abomination and garbage, and we'll get into that a little bit later, but um, I don't even know where to get news anymore, so I go to a, sat a Christian satire site, okay? But he gave, he sat down and he gave an interview with the Babylon Bee, and I'll use many of those quotes, but all that to say this, Elon Musk, the, I mean, I think he, the last time I checked, he's the richest person in the world, as far as like on paper. He's, um, he's not prideful, which is impressive, being the richest person in the world. You can tell that he's not a prideful person just by the way he speaks and the way he talks um, with people. He's an inventor. Um, he's, he's unlike a lot of the people that we talked about. Um, he's not somebody that is focused on, on trying to convince everybody how great he is. You know, he's not, he doesn't have this, this vain glory that he's obsessed with about himself. You know, of course, he got his start um, as a, I think he was a programmer, a software guy, and he started a couple small businesses, and that led him to um, be a co-inventor of PayPal, where he got some money there, and then he reinvested these things into companies now that he owns like Tesla, SpaceX, and I believe SolarCity is a, is a subsidiary of that as well. But look, this, all that to say this, as an inventor myself, as an engineer myself, I generally like Elon Musk. I generally like this person. You say, what? You know, he's not saved. You know, what you, how could you like somebody that's not saved? Look, I like, I like a lot of people that are not saved. Just because somebody's not saved doesn't mean you can't, you know, that you don't have to, you, know, you don't like them, right? I mean, we love people as Christians in general in our life. But look, here's the thing. Elon Musk, he doesn't believe the Bible. Okay, he doesn't believe the Bible. Look, I'm going to read you some quotes from this Babylon Bee interview where he talks about his religious background. In the interview, Musk discussed, Musk discussed his complex religious background, which he included that he, he went to Ang Anglican school. I went to Anglican Sunday school, uh, you know, Church of England, basically. Um, and uh, and the, but I was also sent to Hebrew preschool, um, 
although I'm not, I'm not Jewish, but <laughs> nonetheless, I was singing Hava Nagila one day and, and Jesus is our Lord the next. Later, he said he had an existential crisis, read the Bible and other religious classics, and concluded there's a whole bunch of things there they didn't teach you in Sunday school. Isn't that the truth? There's a great wisdom in the teachings of Jesus. Now, this is where you're going to see that Elon Musk, he diverges greatly from the people that we've talked about in this series before. This is what he says about Jesus. I mean, let's just say, like, I agree with the principles that Jesus advocated. Um, and th that the, you know, there's some, some, there's great wisdom in what, in, in the te teachings of, of Jesus. Uh, and I agree with those teachings. Um, and things like turn the other cheek are, are very important because as opposed to an eye for an eye. Um, an eye for an eye leads everyone blind. So forgiveness, you know, is important and um, treating people as you would wish to be treated. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Very important. So he, then he says in the interview, he says, I don't really worship anything. Okay, but let me ask you this. Is the man blasphemous? Was he blasphemous to Jesus? No, he just, he just doesn't understand, and you can kind of tell from his quote there, he doesn't really understand the Bible. He doesn't really understand who Jesus was. Kind of looks at Jesus as many people that are just decent people that aren't saved look at Jesus as just kind of this example, kind of this guy that taught us how to live kind of this guy, but we know that there's much more to that story. So look, he's not blasphemous, which is why I believe he's not completely confounded and he's had a lot of success in this world because he's not just coming out just blaspheming, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ like many of these other people that we've talked about. I also appreciate many things about Elon Musk. I appreciate his, his free speech stance. I appreciate, you know, his... His, uh, you know, his stance against this, this woke uh, movement in our country. He actually, calls, um, he actually calls the woke movement in our country. He calls it, and, and this is so interesting that he calls it this, he calls it a mind virus. It, it is a prevalent mind virus and um, arguably one of the biggest threats to modern civilization. Now, what's interesting is, is this man is not saved and he doesn't believe the Bible, but he has noticed something that the Bible talks about. He has noticed something that is coming from Romans chapter 1, where we're seeing this, this virus born out of people that have literally been given over, the Bible says, to a reprobate mind. He's not saved. He's noticing it. He's noticing what happens. He calls this mind virus one of the biggest threats to modern civilization. Agree. It's so interesting that this man who's not saved and doesn't believe the Bible notices this. And it gives me hope for humanity that maybe there's some common sense left over. He says, look what he says about wokeness. He says, it's, devi it's divisive. It's exclusionary, and here, look what he says. He says it's hateful. At, at its heart, wokeness is divisive, um, exclusionary, um, and hateful. It's, it's, it basically gives mean people a reason, a, 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 it, it gives them a shield to be, to be mean and cruel, mm. armored in false virtue. Now, that is so interesting, especially, especially in the month of June, when we are literally being, every single day of this month, we are having this idea shoved in our face that an abomination to the Lord is good. That an abomination to the Lord is love. We're literally being told opposites today. And somebody that's not even saved recognizes this. We're talking about, you know, this idea of homosexuality and all the unnaturalness that goes along with it and is associated with it is, is being taught. Look, first of all, pride is always bad in the Bible. We're being told that, that people should have pride, which is bad always in the Bible, in an abomination to the Lord. This is like opposite of everything the Bible could say. And then here's another thing. Here's another thing that just like 
makes my head want to explode is that Christians, and I, when I say Christians, I mean Bible-believing Christians. Okay, I'm not talking about Catholics. I'm not talking about people that claim you know, Christ. I'm talking about people that are saved, that have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that have trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ, and are sealed by the Holy Spirit, and believe every word of the Bible, which, by the way, is Jesus. Jesus is the Word become flesh. If you're saved today, you can't like pick and choose what's in the Bible. I mean, I would like every pastor that just picks and chooses out of the Bible what to preach and what not to preach to at least stand up and say, I don't believe in Jesus. Please at least stand up and say that. But here's what really bothers me, and this is why I love that he recognizes that this wokeness is hateful in itself. Because Christians today, Bible-believing Christians, are being painted as violent by these people that are abomination to the Lord. They're being painted. No, it's, it's like opposite world. It's like opposite world. We are sitting here and we're, we're being, having this shoved in our face that a pastor that gets up and says, this is abomination. This is abomination. The Lord hates this. The Lord hates this. You know what? That is the most loving pastor. That is the most loving pastor. Why? Because I read last week that there's parents now that have a three-year-old child that are beginning to transition this child. That infuriates me. You know why? You know why that infuriates me? Because I love children. We literally have this abomination sanctioning, we have government sanctioned child abuse in this country. We have public schools sanctioning child abuse in this country. We love people. Then we have the same people that say, look, here's proof, here's proof. Here's 1,600 years of proof that Christians are not violent, that Bible-believing is a matter of fact, and it's the same thing that we're seeing today. 1,600 years of Christians being tortured, killed, burned, because they will not deny Christ, because they will not deny the Bible, because they will not stop reading the Bible, they will not stop preaching the Bible. And all it is is love for people. Love to get people the gospel. Love to get people saved. Love to protect people with the Bible and what the Bible says. You know, it's just like, it's like, it's like Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist, that said if you repeat a lie long enough, people will begin to believe it. That's exactly what's happening today. And I'm so happy that somebody else realizes this. That somebody else realizes this. Look. We're talking about Christians being called violent today when churches are being bombed. Churches, we, we know pastors who have had their churches blown up. They had to move because their church was bombed. No one cares. Pastors being, I mean, just the pastors that I know personally that have had so many death threats and worse, things I won't even repeat. Sent to them, about not only them, about them, their spouse, their wife, their children. What is going on today? We have completely lost our minds today. This country has gone insane today. And by the way, these are the same people that are attacking pro-life people as well. It's all the same people. We have, we have churches being vandalized all over the country. We have pro-life organizations um, being harassed, vandalized, assaulted by the Supreme Court Justice. Not that they're Christian, but the Supreme Court Justice, was, was, they tried to assassinate him because of his pro-life stance. And the Bible-believing Christian is violent? If you repeat a lie long enough, I guess people will start to believe it. But it is so nice. I mean, look, so I appreciate a lot of the things that Elon Musk recognizes. So do not get me wrong. I do not dislike the man. He says, he says, wokeness. Look at this. This is another quote. He says, wokeness. And, you know, I understand that he's not taking it to the biblical, you know, lessons that I'm telling you this morning. But he says, wokeness gives people uh, a shield to be mean and cruel. This is his own words. Armored in false virtue, he says. That's pretty good that he notices that. That's pretty good. Look, that shows you the intelligence of the man and that he hasn't been completely confounded. Look, it's a mob. It's a mob. 
It's a violent mob. That's what the LGBT community is. That's what the abomin these people that are pushing abomination on this country is. It's a violent mob. That's why they're the ones doing the bombings, making all the threats, and it's, and it's, it, it's completely out of control. Let's go back to Musk. I like the guy. All that to say this, I like the guy. I, I, you know, I don't, I, don't, he doesn't, I don't follow him or anything like that, but I just want to make sure that you understand that the tone this morning is different than the tone I've taken in the other sermons like this. I, look, I've met lots of people, I've met lots of people in my life that are unsaved, and I have tremendous amounts of respect for them. I have tremendous amount of respect for them. You know, I mean, I remember just, I've been working with guys for the last, dec you, know, you know, a couple decades, where I, I can remember being in rooms with people at work and, and being in technical conversations and meetings, and just being like, I'm privileged to be sitting here with these two guys right now. Just because of just the knowledge base that they have. Just what they can do in their life. Just these two, I mean, they're just the expertise that they have in their fields. I mean, they're just very talented people. Elon Musk is in this category for me. That, all that to say that. Okay? But he's confounded all the same. And we'll talk about that um, this morning. First of all, he is, let me just give you a few points about Elon Musk. Keep your place in Isaiah chapter 24. The first thing I want to point out is he is very intelligent. He is very clearly a very intelligent person. However, he has kind of this, this, over, um, this overreaching concern for the earth. Okay, And I want to kind of point that out um, this morning, that if you don't believe the Bible, and I'm going to show you this morning, that if you don't believe the Bible, that one thing alone can send you off on some really strange tangents in your life. And if you don't get anything out of the sermon this morning, I hope you take that away from this sermon, is that if you don't believe the Bible, that one thing alone will just send you off. And look, it could, it could cause you to just misdirect the whole effort of your life. Okay? I mean, obviously that's not us, we're saved, but for people listening that don't believe the Bible, this is a risk that you have. Look, he's a very intelligent person, but his genius lies not in probably what many people think. You know, his genius doesn't really lie in electric cars. His genius doesn't really lie in solar power or in rocket technology or privatizing space exploration. His genius really lies in forming big businesses, big ideas. He's a big idea guy that governments will subsidize, that governments will give money to. He, that's where his real genius lies. And look, it's, it's genius. I'm not for government subsidies, but he's nailed this. He's very very smart in forming businesses that are subsidized by governments. The governments have the most money. I'm talking about the United States, China, whatever other governments. You know, look, electric cars, they're all subsidized. Okay? I mean, they're, they're all subsidized. Same thing with solar power. It's all subsidized. SpaceX, he's getting government contracts from NASA. You know, the government, they're, they're, too, they're too dumb to be able to fly to space without killing everybody. You know, so they have to have some private company do it. I kind of like that idea that a private company had to come in and do that. But look, this is where his genius lies. He's been able to identify these markets that the government will give money to. All right, and look, he's very good at creating compelling products and services to meet that need. He's very good at that. Uh, I didn't put all this effort into building SpaceX and, and uh, Tesla because I thought they were easy ways to make money. Um, I mean, anyone who starts a car company thinking it's the easy way to make money is a fool. Um, there are only two car companies that have not gone bankrupt in the history of the United States, and that's Ford and Tesla. And Tesla came um, within in inches of going bankrupt multiple times, as did SpaceX. So, right, and like who starts a rocket company think it's going to be successful? Um, I, I started, I mean, I, the, both, both those companies I, I thought had less than a 10% chance of success. So you say, okay, you're just like so complimentary to him. I mean, just like, what's the deal? Or how is he confounded? Here's how he's confounded. Here's how he's confounded. He's confounded. The first way he is confounded is that he has a heavy focus on saving the planet Earth. Okay? And he has a heavy focus on saving the planet Earth. And that's what drives many of his ideas, things he spends his time, his money on. Um, you know, first of all, electric cars, they create they create more CO2 than a, than a gas powered car in the lifetime of that car. And you don't have to be like an expert engineer to know that. I believe Elon Musk knows this, okay? But he still is a good at identifying these markets. He's not also, he's not an alarmist about climate change. 
He's not a, a crazy alarmist about it. He just thinks that, hey, there's calculated risk to it. I'm going to try to find um, some solutions to it. He, he pushes the idea that we're going to run out of coal and run out of oil and we need to fix these issues. Well, my original interest in electric vehicles was not so much due to environmental concerns, but rather from the uh, concern that uh, we'd run out of oil uh, eventually and uh, or it would become extremely scarce and expensive and then uh, civilization would collapse because we can drive cars or you know run power plants and stuff so so we need some form of sustainable energy generation and consumption or, or civilization is going to collapse so that was my original interest in electric vehicles and solar energy and and then I, I do think there's um, some risk of uh, negatively affecting the climate uh, you know as, as you increase the co2 concentration in the oceans and atmosphere, this, you increase the risk of something uh, going wrong. Um, you know, I've been, and many of you don't know this, but uh, I was in the coal industry as an environmental engineer, actually, for um, close to 10 years. And the plant that we worked at, we were going to run out of coal in about 900 years. So this is not something we need to be concerned about today. I do believe that Elon Musk also um, knows this. But let's talk about this idea of man-made global warming and the environmental alarmism that we see today. Because this drives much of Elon Musk's, uh, his life, okay? So look, turn to Genesis chapter number eight. Turn to Genesis chapter number eight. Turn to Genesis chapter number eight. And let me just give you some context here. You're like, oh, you're a pastor. What do you know? Well, like I said, I was an environmental engineer for close to 10 years. I worked in the coal industry. I I believe that there's value in not, you know, wrecking the, you know, throwing a bunch of garbage into the environment. I believe that there's environment, there's, there's value in that. As an environmental engineer, what I did was I was responsible at three different power plants that burned coal to removing, finding, researching, developing, and implementing technologies that remove sulfur, they remove nitrogen oxides, they remove particulate. If you see smoke in the air, that's particulate. It's ash in the air is what you're seeing. We removed mercury from these plants. These things, and look, these things, the reason we're removing these things is not just because the EPA was telling us, but they have real health effects on people. If you have a bunch of ash flying up in the air, that hurts people's lungs. That's the, look, but the point is, it's not going to end the planet. Okay, it's not going to end the planet. So as we were fixing all these issues over the last 10 years, in, you know, by burning hydrocarbons. I, I don't even like to call them fossil fuels. We can get into that later. But as we were fixing all these problems, then the government came out and said, oh, CO2 itself is a problem. And if you know anything about burning anything, if you burn hydrocarbons, you basically get CO2 as the byproduct and water. So they're basically saying when they, when they started making regulations or threatening regulations with CO2 and pushing this man-made global warming, which then turned into climate change because the temperature was going like this, so they went either way. They're saying, we're going to do this, we're going to heat up the earth, we're all going to die. What they were doing is just trying to ban burning anything, is what they were trying to do. Look, but here's the thing, CO2 is not harmful to people. CO2 is not harmful to people. As a matter of fact, plants love it. And as CO2 rises in the atmosphere, the plants, the, the farmers are getting higher yields from their crops. The plants, they take in CO2 and they exhale oxygen. Okay? So there's pretty much a consensus today on the idea that man is causing the earth to change the climate. There's pretty much a consensus like that today. But let me tell you something. Ten years ago, I would go to international conferences and we would talk about these technologies and talk about these things. And 90% of the engineers at these conferences, we would all sit there and listen to these emerging um, presentations on CO2, and we're all just like, this doesn't sound right. Like, nobody agreed with it. But I, I just, look, science is very political today. That's all I can say. I'm not going to get into the, all the details of this. We're going to get into the sermon here. But science is tied to money today. Science is tied to politics today. That's why it's gone completely off the rails. Okay, but look, here's the difference between my view on climate change and Elon Musk's view on climate change. It really comes down to this, the Bible. And it's very explainable. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not mad at him. He's just, he's, he's adopting the consensus that's out there. 
But the reason that I don't adopt that consensus, look, I have plenty of scientific reasons that I could go through and we could debate the whole thing um, this morning, but we're talking about the Bible, and that's the main difference. Turn to Genesis chapter 8. Are you there? Look at Genesis chapter 8. So here's why. Look, I am for being a good steward of the planet that we live on. I don't like, you know, pollution. I don't like smog. I don't like trash everywhere. But these things are not going to end the earth. These things are not going to end the earth. How do you know that? Because of the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 8 and verse number 22. God literally promised us this. Look, we're not going to be able to control the weather. What God promised us in verse number 22 of Genesis chapter 8, the Bible says, God says, he says, while the earth remaineth, he says, seed time and harvest and cold and heat, summer and winter and day and night shall not cease. That's pretty specific right there. That's pretty specific. After God floods the earth, he makes this promise. He's like, hey, all these things are going to go on like this, like I planned it, until it's my time to end it. That's what God is saying here. I mean, that's pretty specific. It's almost specific enough to the point where you almost have to wonder, like, did God know that we were going to be heading down these roads today? Did God know that, because here's the one thing about climate change, it's one of these very few things that unites the whole world. It's one of these very interesting topics that every country is coming to a consensus on. And this is how these topics, you always have to pay attention to those types of variables, those types of issues that unite the world, because before the Antichrist can come to power, the world will be united. The Antichrist is going to unite the world. And that is what will, you know, that will be a definite milestone. So that's what I always, that's a clue. When we see these issues pop up that everybody in the world agrees on to a degree, you know, these are things that we need to pay attention to. Turn it back to Genesis chapter 1. Turn back to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 28. So God literally promises us that climate change will not happen. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, he says, seed time and harvest, cold and heat. He's like, the seasons. Look, all you have to do, folks, most of the man-made climate change um, evidence is anecdotal. It's people under the age of 35 or under the age of 40 that are like, man, this weekend was hot. It's crazy. Wrecking the world. But if you talk to somebody over the age of 60, especially farmers, you know what they'll tell you? They're like, yeah, you know what? This drought, this is like just like back in 1982. This is like the drought of 1950. I remember these times. My great grandpa used to tell me about these times because farmers remember this stuff because it affects them greatly. So it's largely anecdotal when, you know, it's 107 degrees yesterday. Everyone's like, oh, man, whew, we need more solar panels. It's like, you know, come on, all right? God promises us that we will not be able to end the, the climate, literally. He tells us that type of detail. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 28. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 28. So it makes sense that Elon Musk would be more in this direction and more going along with this. Because what am I using this morning? I'm using the Bible. The Bible, look, I'm telling you, as an engineer, as a scientist, as an inventor, the Bible has greatly affected my career. It greatly affected like, what I believe is true and what I believe isn't. And it's been, it's been a successful one. And I believe that the reason for that is because I believe the Bible. I've not found anything in my technical life that does anything except back up what the Bible has told me. Nothing. The Bible is very scientific. Genesis 8.22 where God says, I will not stop the seasons. I will not stop cold and heat. I will not stop winter, day and night, summer, none of these things until my time of choosing, until the end. He says, look, he says, while the earth remain, I'm not going to stop it. That's a very specific scientific statement in the Bible. Look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 28. And God blessed them and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. He's talking to Adam and Eve here. He's talking to, he says, and replenish the earth. He's like, go out and have children. And look what he says, and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Look, he says have dominion over the fish and the animals and all this, but look what he says about the earth. He says subdue the earth. He says, subdue the earth. He says, use it. I believe that God put the coal there and he put the oil there. I believe it was there. I don't believe it came from dinosaurs. There's plenty of other people that believe the same thing, by the way. This is just my opinion. You don't have to have this opinion. But he's saying, subdue the earth. He's like, use it. Use it. Look, he, he doesn't say wreck it, fill it with smoke. He doesn't say that. 
He doesn't say fill it with sulfur and fill it with, you know, bad things. He's like, they cause health problems because, like, we're going to suffer those health problems if that's what happens. But he says we should be stewards of it. My, my father-in-law would say all the time, my father-in-law was a farmer and a rancher, and he would say all the time, you take care of the land, and the land will take care of you. Be a good steward of it, but use it, subdue it. And what he's saying is don't, don't abuse it, like any, every farmer knows. If you go out and you just, you just drive the land to its limits every single year, you know, you could probably get more yield out of your land in one year, but you will suffer for years to come. You could probably graze that crop down to, or that, that, that pasture down to like less than a golf course, but then it's just not going to produce well the next couple of years. So we're to be good stewards of it, but we're to subdue it. And what's happening today is we're starting to worship it. As Roman 1 says, worship the creature more than the creator. Okay? But we will not, all that to say this, we will not be able to end the earth ourselves. Or to control or stop the seasons from happening. Okay? Look, that is an arrogant, prideful attitude. It seems to be our main problem today, actually. But it's an arrogant, prideful attitude to think that we can control God's climate. We can control um, the weather. I mean, there's plenty of earthly arguments, by the way, without the Bible. You know, other, I've already mentioned a couple. CO2 is good for plants. It increases yields. The, the more CO2 there is, the more a plant takes in. You know, the sun, the sun's a variable. The sun's a variable. Here's an interesting one. Cloud cover's a variable. Here's another interesting one. Other planets are warming at the same rate as Earth. That's weird to have factories on Mars. Other planets are warming the same as Earth. I mean, are there men there? You know, what's going on? But here's the thing. CO2 sinks. The thing that takes the CO2 out of the atmosphere is, is two things. It's the land, all the plants, all the jungles and all this kind of stuff. And the major one is the ocean, which covers two-thirds of the Earth. And the more CO2 there is, the more it takes in, the more it takes out of the air. However, not to get into those arguments, but my main reason for this is because of the Bible. Okay, it's because of the Bible. Now, here's where Musk goes even further with this idea that the planet is in trouble. Okay, that the planet is in trouble. So he doesn't believe, um, he's following a scientific consensus, and he's, he's going, and he's a big idea guy. I mean, he doesn't like, hey, I'm going to invent like a, a better toaster, which I'm sure he could. Okay, but he's like, you know what, we're going to like fix something that's, 200 million years out as a problem, okay? And look, he's trying to, another thing that he's, he's pushing for is this idea that we need to become an interplanetary species, okay? Because in 500 million years, now you see, like, this is an intelligent man, okay? But you see how confounded you become if you don't have the Bible, if you don't have the Word of God. So, I mean, this is such a great, uh, it's such a great, case to study here. Such a, it's, it's a great test case, is this man who's very smart, but he wants to make us a multi-planet species because the sun is going to expand in 500 million years. Okay, the earth is 6,200 6, years old, folks. And certainly the, 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 sun, the sun is slowly expanding, so uh, you know, the earth's rough, roughly four and a half billion years old. Some people might disagree with that, but <laughs> it appears to be that way. Um, uh, and um, it, 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 roughly half a billion years, the sun will expand to make, make Earth probably uninhabitable. In a billion years, definitely uninhabitable. Okay, and he's like, and here's where he really gets into it. Okay, and look, he's sincere. One of the reasons I like him is because he's sincere. He's sincere. He's like, and this is what he's missing. This is ultimately what you will miss if you don't believe the Bible, because he's sitting there, and he wants to become a multi-planetary species, and, and specifically, he wants to colonize Mars. Okay, you're, you're smiling, and ha-ha, and the kids are laughing, but it's a real thing. It's completely confounded, though, because, simply, because he doesn't believe the Bible. That's where it leads you. Look, that's where it leads you. If you don't believe the Bible, if you're not saved, you don't believe that there's a God, it leads you to these questions. Why are we here? I think, I think uh, it's important that we take the actions, like, like that we become a space-bearing civilization and a multi-planet species. This is an exciting, inspiring future. You know, you need to have things that 
when you wake up in the morning, you're like, you're excited about the future. Why live if, if it's all about solving problems or being miserable? Like, why live? Um, so there gotta be things that are, that are inspiring, that like, you know, get you in the heart. And I think space is one of those things. What, what's our purpose in being here? Where do we go from here? Are we alone? This is Mikio Kaku with the aliens coming that he's going to steal from. This is where it leads you. Every single one of the dollars that are spent on colonizing Mars will be a waste. I can tell you that now. I can tell you that with logic, but I'm just using the Bible this morning. Go to Isaiah chapter 24. If you kept your place there, go to Isaiah chapter 24. I can tell you specifically from the Bible. Here's what I'm, I've already told you. There's no aliens, folks. I'm sorry, there's not. Isaiah chapter 24, I can also tell you this. Without a doubt, we will never colonize Mars. We will never, we will never colonize Mars. You say, how can you say that? Because the Bible. Because the Bible. That's my main point this morning. I'll give you some logical reasons why too. But the Bible tells us we will never colonize Mars. Look at Isaiah chapter 24. What popped out at you when we were reading Isaiah chapter 24? The earth, the earth, the earth, the inhabitants thereof, the inhabitants of the earth. In the context of what? In the context, and we should pay attention to this today, in the context of the judgment of God. Look at Isaiah 24. Let's just read the first few verses. Behold, the Lord maketh, what? The earth empty, and make it waste, and turn it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The inhabitants of what? The solar system. The inhabitants of the earth. The inhabitants of the earth. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant. He's just listing all the different kinds of people. With the maid, her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, so with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, as with the giver of usury to him. You know what the point of verse number two is? You know what the point of verse number two is? He's listing all the different types of what? Of the inhabitants. He's saying, nobody's getting away from this. He's saying, no, I don't care what you do for a living. I don't care where you are. All the inhabitants of what? The earth. Every single one of them. Don't care what you do. Don't care where he came from. Look at all these different occupations. He's trying to get the point across in verse number two that everybody is going to deal with this. Amen. All right? Except the people that live on Mars. Verse 2.5. Look at verse number three. The land shall be partially emptied except for Mars. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled. For why? For the Lord has spoken this word. Verse number four. The earth mourneth and fadeth away. The world languisheth and fadeth away. The haughty people of what? The haughty people, that means the arrogant, the prideful people. The people that thought that they could control God's creation. The people that thought that we had the power to inhabitate all these other different planets in the solar system. These arrogant people, it says, they do languish. The people, but of the earth. Of the earth do languish. The earth, verse 5, also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. Because they have, why? Because they live on earth? Is he talking about just the people because they live on Earth? God's like against them because they're from that planet. There's all these people living on these different planets, but he's just against the people of the Earth. No, he's saying that he's, this is a judgment because they've transgressed the laws. They've transgressed the laws. And look, who's a sinner? For all have sinned. For all have So all, we're talking about all people here. All people here, and they're going to be judged on the Earth. Look at verse number six. You're like, this is pretty simple. Look, this is pretty scientific. When we have people talking about crazy stuff, like we're going to go colonize Mars and literally spend trillions of dollars to colonize other planets that will never happen, it's like, hey, let's just read Isaiah 24. Let's save the money. Let's save the money. Let's put the money towards, like, you know, I don't know, preaching the gospel to people. Look at verse number six. Therefore hath the curse. The curse is because these people broke the everlasting covenant of verse five. Okay, they broke the everlasting, they transgressed the laws, so they're cursed. Therefore, at the curse devoured the earth, that they may dwell therein are desolate. Therefore, the inhabitants of what? The earth are burned, and few men left. Look, don't dismiss the words of the Bible. God is telling us here that all this is going to take place on the earth. Five times in just those few verses, he says, the earth, the earth, the earth, the earth, the earth. It's literally talking about this planet, this rock that we're living on right now. There's no Mars. There's no Mars there. We are not going to live on Mars. Let me give you some facts on Mars, if I haven't convinced you yet. 
All right, Mars is negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit. That's cold. Mars is negative 81 degrees Fahrenheit on average. On average. The, the soil on Mars is poisonous. It's filled with things. You could never grow anything there. And here's another thing. Here's the, here's the true irony. Here's the atmosphere of Mars. Mars' atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. <laughs> like, I thought CO2 is bad. It's 95% carbon dioxide, 3% nitrogen, 1.6% argon. Have you heard oxygen in there yet? And it has traces of oxygen, kind of like our atmosphere has traces of carbon dioxide. Mars's atmosphere has traces of oxygen. You know, our atmosphere is 21% oxygen. Okay, we need that to live. It's completely confounded. By the way, and, and also, if you were on Mars and you were standing there, and you were, say you had a nice big coat on, you had a gas mask on, you know, so you're like, I got oxygen and I'm not cold because I got a coat on, your blood would boil immediately and you would explode because there's, there's no pressure there. The pressure is zero as, as a point, uh, opposed to like 14.7. So like your, your, the, the water in your blood would immediately flash to steam and you would explode. So yeah, people don't like Fresno. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? It's like, and, and here's the thing, getting to Mars, getting to Mars, they figure that you have to get to Mars within seven months. Okay? It's, it's a long ways away. They don't think they can get there in seven months, but if they don't get the astronauts to Mars in seven months, they're going to die from radiation poisoning, from, you know, the radiation in, in space. All right? So, any, and you'll blow up when you get there, and, you know, any volunteers? So it's, it's, I'm, I'm trying to get you to understand how confounded this is. Turn to Revelation chapter, chapter 21. Let's, just, let's look at some more astrology in the Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 21. The Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. We talked about a lot of judgment and, and burning and destruction in Isaiah chapter 24. So the Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Look at verse number 1 of Revelation chapter 21. Verse number one of Revelation chapter 21. The Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and their God. And God shall wipe away tears, all the tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. But even then, we're not talking about a new few planets. We're talking about a new earth. A new earth. Folks, I'm not saying that we're not going to spend trillions of dollars on, the, on this earth and, and shoot some poor soul into Mars. We may do that one day. But he or she is going to die. They're probably going to die. I'm telling you, I'm not even saying that, you know, we might not even get some foolish volunteer to land on Mars one day, but we will never colonize Mars. Why? Because the Bible and because common sense. We'd be better off colonizing Antarctica. You know, we'd be better off colonizing the worst place on Earth. So look, I would love to, I mean, Elon Musk, I would love to explain the Bible to this man. And you know what? I believe from the things that I've heard, I actually believe that he has the heart where he might listen. He's humble. He's not prideful. I believe he's truly intelligent. And I believe that he's very sincere in the things that he's doing, I, according to what he believes. I believe that he likes to do big things. I believe that he likes to think big. Look, it would be wonderful to have someone like this on our side. It would be wonderful to see someone like that get saved. And it's also interesting that he's, he's on the right side of so many issues of the day, where at least he's noticing the good versus evil of what is happening today. He's not completely lost his common sense. His heart has not, you know, completely turned. And look, you see, that, you see that because when you see his statements on religion, you see his statements on Jesus, he's not turned on God. He just doesn't know who God is. Look, he's a perfect example of the people that we're looking for when we go out preaching the gospel. Somebody that just, they have a, they're not, they're humble. They have a, a decent heart. Um, look, how many people could say that they were humble if they had $200 billion? That, that's, that's a unique thing about this man. Look, he just doesn't know the truth. 
That's all. That's all. And you just remember the blasphemous statements that I read you from some of the other people that we looked at. That's why they are so wrong on everything. And they accomplish nothing. Look, I wish Elon Musk, I wish Elon Musk would get saved. Now, in the, the, the Babylon Bee actually did him a disservice. If you've ever seen the interview with Elon Musk, because towards the end of the interview, they just they said, you know, here's some funny guys, they write satire, and I don't know if these guys are saved or not. I would hope that they are, but you don't know. And they say to him at the end, they're like, hey, real quick, real quick, can we get you to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? We're wondering if you could do us a quick solid and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> if, um, you know, if, if, if Jesus is, is uh, saving people, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't stand in his way. You know, like, I'll be sure. I'll be saved. Why not? Just real quick. This is like exactly what we don't do. They're like trying to just get Elon Musk to say, so then he's like, well, sure, Jesus is, is uh, saving people. I, I suppose, I'll, you know, I'll let him save me. Not knowing what that means or whatever. And they're like, yes! Just for their own, I mean, there be, look, the thing is like, it really, that part bothered me because here's a man that, that's nice. Here's a man that, that they're all just enamored to be in his presence because he's famous and he's a big figure in all this. But look, he's a soul just like everybody else. And his, his eternal damnation is just as real as, as, as some person that we knock on their door in Fresno. I mean, we should just, I mean, we shouldn't be making a joke out of, out of somebody's, you know, spiritual s state of, of not being saved. And, you know, it's, it's really a shame. Turn to Isaiah chapter 47. It's really a shame that somebody like that is headed for eternal damnation. I would love to sit down and spend 30 minutes, 40 minutes. I'm sure it would be a much longer conversation with somebody like him, but it just give him the simplicity of the gospel. Because you know what? That man might listen. That man might listen. Look at Isaiah chapter 47. And can you say that about many other extremely wealthy people in the world today? No, you can't. Look at Isaiah chapter 47. So they should not have made a joke about that. You know, and I'm not, like I said, I'm not endorsing the Babylon Bee. Look at Isaiah chapter 47. Look at verse number 12. The Bible just has so many statements where you just think like, God must have known God must have known how arrogant, how prideful we get. You know, man would rise up and God would allow us to unlock some secrets of the universe. He would allow us to unlock some things in this physical world. Because look, every invention that happens, every, you know, uh, machine that's invented, and every law of physics that's discovered, that's just unlocking what God already had put there. All we are doing as engineers and as scientists is just trying to reverse engineer what God already had there. We're just trying to make machines that can operate within the rules that God gave us. And that's why I believe that so many of the people that invented so many great things 100, 200 years ago, they, they believed the Word of God. And God allowed them to unlock His creation. That's what we're talking about. Look at verse number 12 of Isaiah chapter 47. You just read things like this, and you're just like, God must have known what we were going to become. Look at verse 12. Stand now with thine enchantments, and with the multitude of thy sorceries, wherein thou hast labored from thy youth. If so be thou that shall be able to profit, if so be thou mayest prevail. God's saying, hey, he's like, you see judgment coming? He's like, why don't you go have your sorcerers save you? He's like, why don't you go have the people that were trying to do magic and the witches and all these people, why don't you have them save you when the judgment comes? Look at verse 13. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. God's saying, God's saying you've been listening to all these other people. You must be tired. You're listening to so much counsel. All you had to do was listen to me. That's what God is explaining here in Isaiah chapter 47. Then look what he says. He says, let now the astrologers and stargazers and monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from these things that shall come upon thee. He's like, go get the astrologers. Go get the people telling you about where the universe came from. He's, he's saying, you know what he's saying? He's saying, why don't you go get Miku Kaku to save you when my judgment comes? That's what he's saying. Because Miku Kaku is not going to be able to save you. None of these people that are trying to get us off Earth onto other planets, they're not going to be able to save us. 
They're not going to be able to save you. He says, behold, look what he says in verse 14. Wraps it up right here. Behold, they shall be a stubble. The fire shall burn them. They shall not deliver themselves from the power of the flame. There shall not be a coal to warm at, nor fire to sit before it. Mars isn't going to save us, folks. If anything, if anything, and I'm just, I'm shocked at this too. If anything, we should look. They say, you know, they say that there's hundreds or, I don't know, thousands probably, depending on who you talk to, of planets in a habitable zone, meaning, meaning the, the, the temperature and the, you know, the, the area away from a star like the sun or something like that. They're estimating that there must be hundreds of planets like, like Earth in a habitable zone, yet there's no creation there. And, and instead of saying, we need to go and, you know, we should be arrogant and prideful and we're going to go and be a multi-planetary species. Instead, if a humble people, if a humble people of earth looked at that, they, you know what they should say? They should see God's creation and God's lack of creation. They should be able to look at the earth that's just lush with the oceans and the life and the animals and the planets and the perfect cycles of the seasons of hot, of cold. Imagine how stable our planet is. It's crazy every single year. It's so stable. It's so stable you can make a living by it. It's so stable you can have growing seasons. And, and they change a little bit every year, and it's a variable thing to a degree. But it's so you can predict the business on it. It's so stable. Yet we can look at all these planets that are just dark, cold rocks. And we don't look at that and say, wow, we are special. That's why the Bible talks about the earth, the earth, the earth, the earth and not all these other planets. Okay, so look, Elon Musk, he, he's, not a, he's not a bad man. He's an unsaved sinner. He's an unsaved sinner. He's sincere. He's intelligent. But he just doesn't believe the Bible. So what that means is it doesn't matter how powerful you are. It doesn't matter how successful you are. Here's the lesson. Here's the lesson. Not believing the Bible equals not only eternal damnation, but wasting your whole life on earth. Because that's the meaning of our life. You say, what's the meaning of your life? Because you believe the Bible. The meaning of my life is to serve the Lord and enrich his kingdom on earth. That's the meaning of my life. Look, I, I'm glad that I have some fun in my life, and I'm glad that I have friends, and I'm glad that um, we can enjoy our lives. But the meaning of my life, look, this is why, this is why, it shouldn't really matter if you're going through hard times or not. Because the meaning of your life doesn't change as a Bible-believing Christian. Because the meaning of your life is just to, you know, to further God's kingdom on earth. It's to be a prophet to other people. That's the meaning of our life. And then you won't start thinking about going to Mars and going to Neptune and all these different things. You'll just be thinking about how you can serve the Lord with your life. How you can get God's kingdom furthered in your physical life, which is just like a, a cup of water being dumped on the ground. Like a vapor, the Bible says. It's, it's like water that can't be gathered up again. So look, folks, I know you're saved this morning, and thank God for that. But appreciate the word of God you have in front of you, because you have people, they're living in opposite world. They're living in a world where they think love is hate and hate and lo is love. By the way, not to go off on that again, but this is why Hollywood, by the way, has been, has been redefining the definition of love for decades. That's why they've been redefining the definition of love to mean some lustful feeling I have towards someone. Because then I can equal love with lust, and now I can get where we're at today. It's, look, appreciate this. You know what this is? This is an anchor. This is an anchor in our lives. Look, Christians can fly off the rails into stupid things too. We got to know the Bible. We got to study the Bible. We got to read the Bible. And then we will see these things and look, it, I, it, it'll just be like, ah. But the difference, the only difference between a sincere man and another sincere man and, and a wasted life and a profitable life bow our heads.